Hi, everyone. My name is Annie Rogers. And on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's live conversation and Q&A titled How to ADHD, an insider's guide to working with your ADHD brain, not against it, with our very special guest, Jessica McCabe. I probably don't need to tell you that Jessica is the creator, writer, and star of the popular YouTube channel, How to ADHD. Since its founding in 2015, the award-winning channel, which is lauded and respected by treatment providers, ADHD researchers, and the ADHD community, has provided scientifically backed and experientially affirming information on how to work with your ADHD brain. Jessica's work has been featured in many places, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Today Online, Upworthy, and of course, in Attitude. Before we jump into our conversation, I want to quickly thank today's sponsor of our webinar, Accentrate. Accentrate is a dietary supplement formulated to address nutritional deficiencies known to be associated with ADHD. It contains omega-3 fatty acids in phosphaloid form, which is the form already in the brain. The brain-ready nutrition supports attention, focus, and emotional balance. You can click the link on your screen or visit phoenixhealthscience.com. That's F-E-N-I-X, healthscience.com, to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinar. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So with that, that out of the way, Jessica, welcome to the Attitude community and congratulations on the well-deserved success of your first book, How to ADHD, which is now officially a New York Times bestseller. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about that. I, it was it was my dream. I was like, I want to finish the book. I want it to be what I want it to be. And I want it to be a New York Times bestseller, which I had no control over. But I was really excited that that's what happened. So anybody who's bought a copy, thank you. That's why it's a New York Times bestseller. I appreciate you. Bam, bam, bam. You did it all. Um, I listened to the audio book and I just found it so incredibly thorough, but also really helpful and empowering um, you did a really, really remarkable job of translating basically the entire library of research <laughs> on ADHD into like provocative and actionable insights. And you weaved it with your own personal story. Um, so uh, for those of you who haven't read it yet, I really do recommend um, How to ADHD. It's, it's based on the, the research from all of our, you know, favorite, <laughs> favorite experts on ADHD, um, explaining how ADHD brains really work. Um, and today we'll go over some of the themes from the book and some of the strategies. Um, and we'll also ask questions that came in from our listeners about all of the above. Um, all right. So getting right into it, I just got to come right out and ask the big question that's on everyone's mind. How did you do it? You wrote... <laughs> a 464 page book synthesizing all of the most important research and insights on ADHD over two years while living with the executive function challenges that you were writing about. How, what did this process look like for you? And, you know, were there any strategies that you like thought would be helpful and effective, but actually weren't? Did you have to pivot as you went? Tell us how you tackled this massive executive function challenge. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a really good question because I am not somebody who finishes long-term projects. I have never in my life finished a long-term project. I dropped out of community college. Uh, I dropped out of massage school. I, 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 got distracted from or quit or was fired from a ton of jobs. Like I am not a long-term project kind of person. And to people who are like, but you've been doing your channel for seven years, not intentionally. Like that was, a, it was a lot of short-term projects. It was, okay, I'm just going to learn about this for a week. And then that project was over. And then there was another project for a week. And then that project was over. So this is the first time I intentionally went into and actually completed a long-term project like this. Um, and it helped a lot that I already knew this information because I'd been learning about how my brain worked and what, where my challenges lie and strategies to support them. Um, I'd been learning all that, but, uh, the first strategy that I tried did not work, uh, at all, which was, I went in going, okay, it's supposed to take me a year to write this book. Can I negotiate for 18 months? 
right? Like time and a half. Can I get, can I give myself extra time? Because I know that I'm going to need that. And um, I got a lot of blank stares <laughs> in the, in the meeting with the publisher where I asked about that. And my business manager kind of pulled me aside and was like, yeah, you don't, you don't want to ask for that because after a year, just the way the publishing industry works, they start to pull support for your book and you're, you're not going to have as much access to your editor. So and I was like, okay, a year it is. All right. Uh, next, next strategy. So the next strategy I had was one of my favorites, which is working backwards. Um, and this is what worked for my short-term projects of I, trying to post a video in a week. Um, I went, okay, what, what is the end goal? And the end goal for my YouTube channel was there's video posted, right? But in order to post that video, I need to have edited that video. Okay. So that needs to happen before I post. Okay. In order to edit the video, I need to have shot the video. Cool. So that needs to happen the day before that. In order to shoot the video, I need to have written a script because I learned really quickly that I uh, go on too many tangents and I'm very hard to edit. So I need to script my material. Also, I wanted to make sure that I was presenting good information. So I scripted everything. So that needed to be done. And I just worked backwards from there. So I did the same thing with the book. I went, okay, if I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to publish a book, I need to have written a book. It needs to be edited. Okay. That means I need time to edit it. And I just worked backwards and plugged in everything that I needed to do over the course of a year. And then I also knew that I tend to hyper-focus. So I gave myself four weeks during that year to to just not work on the book at all or the channel or anything so that I wouldn't die. <laughs> like I was like, I don't know what, what happens if I hyper-focus on a project for a full year, but I'm pretty sure it's not healthy. So <laughs> let me, let me give myself breaks. Um, and it, I, I did a lot of planning. Um, I used a lot of strategies. I put accountability in place. So any week that, I, that was a let's work on this book week, I, I told my editor, like, I, you know, I, I'm not the kind of person who can just hand, hand you a book at the end. Um, I will not have written it until the night before. Right. So like, I need, I need you to be looking at it as we go. So anytime I had a, a week blocked off where I was going to work on a chapter, I met with her on Thursday and she was East coast. I'm West coast. So, um, what would happen is I would meet with her at 11 AM on Thursday, which meant I had until basically midnight or, you know, five in the morning, but really midnight on Wednesday to like write and, and send over something. And then she would get to work in the morning and read it before our meeting. So that, that accountability helped a lot. There were times where I handed her a hot pile of garbage, but I had to hand her something. So I did have to work on it when I said I was going to work on it. So that was helpful. There, there were just, there were a ton of strategies, but, um, I, I was still, a, a few months late on, on the final project, but I just stayed in communication with my editor and I was like, Hey, this is what's going on. Um, I'm going to be a little bit late on this, or I need a little more time to edit that. And, um, she was really good about working with me and also letting me know when it got to the point where she's like, okay, we can't, we can't give you any more extensions. Like we actually need this to be done at this point. So it was, it was good. There was a lot of communication, accountability, planning ahead, um, and yeah, the, it, it, it was done. I'm still in shock that it got done, but it was done. I love that you, that you scheduled in those, like, as you call them in the book, the, the walks in the woods. And we'll, um, I'll ask you a little bit more about that as well. Like those, those breaks from the hyper-focus, because as you said in the book, like you have a whole, um, chapter on hyper-focus, which I found really illuminating in a couple different ways. Um, one of which was just the, like the exhaustion that really could follow, you know, even though you might've been hyper-focusing on a passion, which clearly this is, you know, a passion for you, um, that at the end of it, you know, you could be so exhausted to the point of wearing yourself down and that it was important to, to keep that in mind and plan around it. So it sounds like that was part of this part of this process too. Yeah, definitely. I'm a big fan of putting guardrails around hyper-focus, um, all, but also taking advantage of it, right? Like there's a lot in my life that I would not have accomplished if it were not for hyper-focus. I definitely do see it as a potential strength, but it can also, it can also be a problem, right? Because we can neglect our needs. We can end up in really unhealthy situations. We can neglect everything else in our life. So I try to, I try to set up my environment in such a way or my time in such a way that I can slip into hyper-focus and take advantage of that, um, that flow, that really deep flow, but at the same time, put guardrails around it so that, um, I say I don't die, like that's hyperbolic, but so that I don't do permanent damage to myself because we know that a lot of people with ADHD end up with chronic pain and fibromyalgia and like, you know, we, we end up, um, neglecting our, our self-care in a lot of ways. 
Um, and part of that, I think, is because of that hyper-focus. If we're really hyper-focused on something for a long time, it's really easy to let other things kind of slide. And so I try to, I try to make sure that there's an, there, there are breaks in my hyper-focus so that I can tend to other things. It's a powerful strategy. Um, so I wanted to go back. You wrote in the book that when you initially started creating uh, your how-to ADHD videos, which was nine, eight or nine years ago, um, your plan was to research the condition so you could learn how to overcome your ADHD struggles and then you could become the person you are <laughs> supposed to be, right? But by the time we reached the end of the book, I'm not like, I don't think this is a spoiler alert. Chapter 13, you land in a, a really different place. So can you tell us a little bit more about that journey, like starting out really trying to hack your ADHD um, and where you ended up kind of at the end of this project? Yeah, I started out, um, first of all, I did not think I would be doing it for as long as I did. I thought I was going out, like I was going out to the store real quick to grab ingredients for dinner and hitting hitting pause on Netflix. And like, when I get back, I'll have everything I need. That's what it felt like. Like, I'm just going to learn how to work with my brain real quick and pick up a few strategies and then I'll come back and then I'll be able to be this person I'm supposed to be and meet all these neurotypical expectations and all that. Um, and it quickly became clear that there was more to ADHD than I thought. And this was going to be a little bit more of a shopping trip than I expected it to be. Um, I needed a few more ingredients. Um, there's a lot of neuro spiciness involved in this recipe, it turns out. So um, it, it was more complicated than I expected it to be. Um, but also uh, at first, and even when I did my TEDx talk, I had this a bit naive idea that, okay, I might have to go about doing things in different ways, but I can still achieve all the same things. I can still have all these neurotypical goals and have this neurotypical life and have a clean house and a clean car and, and, you know, keep in touch with friends. I just have to do it in a way that's ADHD friendly, right? I just have to use these tools. I have to use these strategies. I was willing to accept that I might have to, you know, if, if my brain works differently, I might have to do things differently, but I wasn't yet willing to accept the limits of that, the limits of, all, using all these tools and all these strategies, because all of these tools and strategies, that takes energy, that takes effort. Um, and no matter how many tools you have, the challenges are still there. I still don't have a clean car. Um, I still, I finally realized I need a housekeeper. Um, I came to a place of, of acceptance. Um, and it, it helped, but I also was very upset about it at first. Cause I'm like, this was not what was promised to be. Like there's so many strategies out there. They're like, Oh, just do this. You know, just use a planner, just do this, just do that. As if like, just do that. And then you, and then you get to be neurotypical and it's just not how it works. And if anybody could have overcome their ADHD, it would have been me. I made it my job. <laughs> this is what I did full time for like years. Um, and it, it just turns out that's not quite how it works. Um, but what I did get out of it was really even more powerful um, rather than being, you know, overcoming these challenges and becoming this person I was supposed to be. I realized that I, I already am, <laughs> I already am the person I'm supposed to be. And yeah, I need supports. I need, I need strategies. I need tools in order to do a lot of the things that I want to do in a, in a world that isn't built for my brain, but I didn't have to feel like the way that I am in the world is wrong because it's not. I got to meet so many other people with ADHD and realized this is actually really delightful. I love it when somebody comes into the room and starts talking excitedly about something that they just learned. Maybe I don't have to overcome that, right? Like there were a lot of things that I realized are actually fine. And they're the only reason that they might not be fine is because we're not in a world that accommodates that or supports that or where that is normalized. But um, more and more, I feel like our world is becoming more accepting and understanding of neurodiversity. And maybe it's okay if you need to swivel in your chair or rock or use a fidget. Maybe, you know, maybe it's okay that you need a housekeeper to keep your house clean. Maybe that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I love this message so much. I think, you know, it's such a such a powerful one. And especially coming from you. I mean, yeah, if you had if you had tried to fit in to some other preordained idea of what you were supposed to be. Like we wouldn't have you here today and you wouldn't be impacting millions of lives, you know, through your, your channel and your book. So you are exactly right. Exactly who you're supposed to be doing exactly what you're supposed to do. Even if it's not at all what you imagined when you were going out to run a quick errand, you know, <laughs> um, I think that's yeah. so powerful. 
I can have a, I'm, I have a really hard time meeting certain expectations, but that doesn't mean I don't have anything to contribute. And I think, I think taking away that compared to neurotypical stencil has helped a lot in realizing like, you know, if you, if you hold a stencil up to somebody um, and it's, it's this neurotypical stencil, you're going to see all the places where somebody with ADHD is too much or not enough. But if you take away that stencil, you get to see them for who they are. And we are curious, you know, curious, engaging, excitable um, beings uh, who think outside the box and, and do really amazing things for the world. And, and I don't, I don't want to discount that, you know, and I, there, there are certain aspects of that, that they're not, you know, they're not separate from the ADHD. They're, they're part of it. These traits exist um, and they can show up in really beautiful ways, especially when we get the support we need to mitigate the impairments. So we received a question along these lines that kind of stopped me in my tracks um, from one of the um, registrants for today's, today's event. Um, Someone wrote in to say, my child is not happy knowing he has ADHD. I always tell him he has ADHD powers he can tap into, but what are those? And it, this kind of dovetails with this message, right? That you, um, you said at the end of your um, journey with the book that you um, reached out to Dr. Ned Hollowell um, to see what research there was regarding you know, the strengths associated with ADHD um, because you weren't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like you weren't comfortable espousing the superpowers of ADHD without having some evidence. Um, and I think that led you to like some really great insights. So I wonder if some of those can be applied to parents who are trying to build confidence and self-esteem in their kids with ADHD who are having an awfully hard time seeing the beauty of it. I think so. Yeah. Um, first of all, school is a really tough place for for kids with ADHD, because a lot of what you're expected to do at school is not very ADHD friendly and you're supposed to fit in and you're supposed to sit still and you're supposed to focus. And it's really easy to see all the places where you're struggling. And so, yeah, it's not, it's not fun, right? It's not fun as a kid. Um, I will say like, as you get older, a lot of the ways in which, which were unique and creative and think outside the box that becomes valuable. Um, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, the, there's not a ton of evidence on the strengths in ADHD because that's not what researchers look for, but sometimes they accidentally find them, which is really cool. Um, there was a study that I heard about years ago where they were trying to see if, um, if they had a group of kids who didn't have ADHD and then they had a group of kids who um, there was one person in the group who had ADHD, if that group with the kid with ADHD would get off task more often and they needed to give them a task to do so they could figure out if they got off task more often. Um, anybody who knows ADHD is like, I'm sure that they did, right? Like, but they, this is what they do in research. They have to confirm what they suspect is true. So, uh, so they gave them, they gave them a worksheet and they gave them th things to do. And they found that, yeah, the, the group with the kid with ADHD in it did get off task more often, but they also got more of the answers right which is really interesting. So it can, ADHD can, uh, and these traits, the way that our brain works can not only be valuable for us, but it can be valuable to those around us. Um, and there is some research on what's called divergent thinking, which is this ability to think outside the box um, and kind of unstick people from this, this, um, this one way of thinking. Our brains make connections that others' brains might not. So there, there, are, there are strengths, there are traits that can show up in really positive ways, but it doesn't always feel like that. So I think it's important to validate, yeah, it sucks. Like it sucks that I forgot my jacket almost every day when I was a kid. It sucks that organization was so hard and that I was stuck doing homework an hour or two after my siblings, you know, were done with theirs. Like there are a lot of things that are really challenging about it. And at the same time, there are things that are that, you know, the the same traits that make these things hard for us can also really be an asset in other ways. Um, and we are, you know, um, hang on, I, I, uh, I, I'll flip to that section because I think it's really important. Um, it's really hard for us to internalize. That's what Dr. Hallowell said is it's really hard for us to internalize our strengths, but we need to, we need to, because we get so many more corrective messages. We get so many more messages that who we are and how we are is not okay, that we almost need to rehearse, um, the things that are good about us. So when I started my channel, there was, there were still a lot of messages in my head about like, 
how much I sucked, frankly, like, and how I was going to fail. And, you know, it's just, I had a lot of negative messages in my head. And so I created, um, I created a, an inspiration for a rainy day file. And anytime somebody said something positive about what I was doing or positive about me, I stuck it in that file. And I would go back and reread that because our brains are naturally going to rehearse the things that we don't like about ourselves. So we almost need to overcorrect by <laughs> rehearsing the things that we do like about ourselves. Um, but I had a, a Dungeons and Dragons metaphor in here um, that I really liked um, that helps me when I'm feeling frustrated that I'm not good at all of the things. And I don't know if this would help help this kid, but um, to use a, a Dungeons and Dragons metaphor, you don't put a mage on the front lines or expect them to battle a dragon single handedly. They'll die. You put together a party of people with different skills and strengths so that everyone can focus on doing what they excel at. No one can be good at all the things. This is why you never split the party. Sometimes we need to level up stats that hold us back, but it doesn't make sense to do that at the expense of what we're already good at. So I, I learned at the end of this book that one of the most important ways to work with your brain, not against it, is to lean into your strengths. Um, that was a very long answer. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> I'm so glad you read that because that quote just um, like I'm not even a Dungeons and Dragons player, but it made me think of, you know, Jumanji or something. Like, it's exactly right. It's exactly right that everybody has a role to play and can bring their strengths to bear in a way that lifts the whole. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so this made me think about um, I was, I was um, watching some of your recent videos on your channel and you had one question that really kind of, um, that stopped you. And I think stopped a lot of people. And it was from someone who said that, that in school, they were held up as habitually as the example of what not to do mm -hmm. um, with their struggles, with their impulse control and their organization and, um, I mean, I can say like, you got angry reading this quote, um, and for good reason, but I think it, it ties into this, right? That school is hard. And what is it that kind of, that really got you upset in hearing about this person who was, who grew up thinking that they were what not to be in school? I don't remember this. <laughs> <laughs> my, my memory is not the best, um, but I get angry a lot because um, there are really neurotypical expectations in school and they can be really ableist and they can be really toxic and problematic. I did recently um, repost something on Twitter where uh, some somebody had gone into some train the trainer um, thing and were and they were they were teaching teachers about how. Um, how are they were teaching these adults about why school rules don't really work for our brains or really for anybody. So they had this list of rules that they expected these adults to follow. And then they had this reward and punishment system of like, you, you would go into the rainy area if you did bad and you would go into the sunny area if you did good. And then there was this neutral area and the rules were things like, um, you know, make eye contact and sit still and don't use your phone. And, you know, it was it was these like school, you know, school classroom rules that you could see in, in a classroom. Um, and it was incredibly difficult for them to learn that way. And that was kind of the point. So, you know, school is just not not really set up for us. And what what makes me angry is to put it in in physical terms. It's like asking somebody in a wheelchair to get up the stairs and not giving them a ramp and then getting upset with them and punishing them when they struggle. We're not only not getting the support we need, we're getting yelled at and punished for struggling. And that is heartbreaking. That is what makes me angrier than anything else. Yeah. And I think that's what I took away from, from your answer was that, hey, look, it's hard. You know, we're trying as hard as we can yeah. and we feel the weight of not living up to your expectations. And then on top of that, here's all this shame yeah. and, and for a kid to face that. So yeah, and you can't, yeah. Punish, it, it's not effective either. You can't punish away a disability. You can't, you know, you can't yell at somebody for being slow on the first lap around and expect them to be, you know, suddenly able to go faster and make up for that first lap if they were slow on the first lap because mm -hmm. they were on crutches or something, right? Like you wouldn't expect somebody on crutches. Well, like you went slower than everybody else that first lap. So now on the second lap, you have to make up for that. But that's what we ask of ourselves. You struggled. So now you not only have to do what everybody else has to do, but you have to do even better to make up for it. Right. 
very passionate so, about this. <laughs> you, you have a wonderful way of describing it. Um, so I wanted to to go back into your your own story a little bit and the fact that um, you know when you were first evaluated for ADHD, the the doctor actually told your mom she's too smart, she can't have ADHD, she's too smart, and those challenges. I mean, I think. Um, I feel like it's only within the last 10 to 15 years that twice exceptionality has been a term that is recognized, a, a, a reality that is recognized, and um, a little bit of insight into kind of the, the signs of ADHD that were missed maybe in your own childhood and, and how that impacted your, your self-esteem and also being a gifted child um, with ADHD, um, kind of how that how that's contributed to your, to your story. Yeah. So that did happen. I was very lucky to have a mom who looked at this professional and said, thank you for your opinion. I'd like to talk to an expert. And that expert understood that not smart had nothing to do with the diagnostic criteria. So, um, so I, I wasn't, I did end up getting diagnosed when I was 12, but uh, and I was very lucky because this was in 1994 and girls were just really not being diagnosed then um, at all. But it ran in my family. My cousin, who was a boy, very stereotypical, bouncing off the walls, getting into trouble, struggling in school, very, you know, very like clear stereotypical ADHD. He was diagnosed um, and my aunt had brought him because she was like, I, I see him struggling with a lot of the things that I struggled with in school. Um, I don't want him to have the outcome that I had. And so the doctor said, okay, and gave them both an evaluation and diagnosed both of them with ADD at the time uh, or ADHD. And, uh, and then my mom looked at me and said, you're a lot like your aunt, let's get you checked out. So I was really lucky that, that I had that, you know, my family, people in my family got diagnosed. We know this is a disorder that's highly genetic. I was able to get diagnosed because my mom advocated for me. But until then I really did fly under the radar and, um, I had a more internalized presentation of ADHD. I was the, I wasn't the kid bouncing off the walls and running around the classroom. I was staring dreamily out the window. And, um, I, I have combined type I have ADHD combined type. So I do have the impulsivity and the hyperactivity, but it showed up as tearing through books. I loved to read. And so that actually helped me in school. Um, I would, you know, my thoughts would bounce all over the place, but I, I would look still, um, I would just be staring dreamily out the window um, the things that people maybe could have seen and picked up on, but they just were like, ah, that's just a kid being a kid, or she's just scattered, or she'd forget her head if it wasn't attached. There were all these explanations. Um, uh, I came home without my jacket on a regular basis. Um, I, no matter how much I tried, I could not keep anything organized. I like my desk always had like a ton of papers and books and things were just shoved in there. And then later that looked like, um, when I got to element or when I got to middle school, that looked like, um, you know, forgetting my books, forgetting my homework, um, shoving things into my backpack last minute and then not being able to find them, forgetting my locker combination. My locker was a disaster. Um, I was messy. My mom called me messy Jesse. Um, and that nickname stuck. Um, and yeah, so I was messy. I didn't get along with my peers very well. Like I wanted to, but I didn't really fit in. I, I had a hard time making friends. I felt very unpopular. Um, and it, it did do some damage to my self-esteem because what happened by, was by the time I got diagnosed, I knew I was flaky and scattered and, uh, and I lost things and I didn't deserve nice things. Um, somebody gave me a, a really pretty pair of actual orange topaz earrings for my birthday. And I almost immediately lost one and I was so upset. And I remember thinking then like, I can't have nice things. And so for, I mean, for decades, like I wouldn't buy myself jewelry. And I would tell people, don't give me anything unless you're okay with me losing or breaking it because I can't have nice things. So, you know, I, because I lost things, because I broke things like, and, and this just became a sense of my identity. And because I was scattered, because I was flighty and flaky and all these, all these negative messages that I got, I didn't take myself seriously. I didn't expect other people to take me seriously. I, um, quite frankly was, um, was, <laughs> Like it set me up for abusive relationships because I was used to people laughing at me. I was used to people making fun of me. I was used to being bullied. I was used to um, being the one who who had messed up and like not deserving to be treated well, um, frankly. So um, there were some lasting damages that happened. Um, and I'm very grateful that I that my ADHD was caught as early as it was. But it was there was a lot of damage done 
by then. I had, I had solidified this idea of who I am and I was not somebody to be taken seriously. I was not somebody worthy of respect. I have to say that what you're, what you've been saying has been resonating through, I'm reading the comments, you know, as they come in and there are women here in their thirties, forties, fifties, and sixties who feel very deeply this internalized shame. And here's a 70 year old, um, who, um, are really struggling still to they, what you said about recognizing your strengths and, and leaning into those, they don't disagree with that, but man, they are having trouble yeah. figuring out what those strengths are. It's tough. It's tough because society doesn't recognize our strengths the way that they, you know, nobody's like, Hey, in order to be a good mom or a good wife, you should have lots of ideas and start a ton of projects. It's no, you should be consistent and on time. And, and, uh, and on top of the, ex you know, executive function, basically for the, your entire family, like you, you should be, you know, baking cupcakes for the, you know, for the school fundraisers. And you should be this, you should be that we get so many shoulds and, and that's what it takes to be a valuable human. And a lot of those shoulds are things that we struggle with. Mm -hmm. Cupcakes are overrated. They really <laughs> are. <laughs> um, okay. We also have a lot of uh, parents here, a, a lot of moms, but, uh, but dads too, um, who want to know, okay, my daughter, we think, or she is recently diagnosed. We think she has ADHD. Um, what are the most important things that we can do to support her um, to try to mitigate, uh, counterbalance these negative messages that we're still working on correcting in our society? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, but I think the, the most important thing, and you're already doing it because you're here, is learning about how these brains work and educating your, your child on how their brain works. Um, because we do get these negative messages um, and explanations as to like why we are the way we are. And they're really harmful and stigmatizing and, and wrong a lot of the time. So understanding the actual mechanisms, what's actually going on in your brain. And I'll give you an example. And this is very, you know, it's a very ableist term, but I'll use it because it's, it's the one that we hear. It's the one that we feel. I felt dumb. I felt dumb so many times because a teacher asked a question. And by the time they got to the, you know, the third possible answer, I'd forgotten the question or somebody introduced themselves to me. And like two seconds later, I'd forgotten their name. I felt so dumb and I was a gifted student and I knew I was a gifted student. I was very smart, but I felt dumb. And it wasn't until I started learning about my ADHD and learning what exactly is impaired that I understood that I have poor working memory. Working memory is a relative area of weakness for me. So while I'm really good with verbal comprehension, my working memory is really bad in comparison. And so it, it created this imbalance of like, I know I'm smart, but I, I don't seem smart because I, because I forget things and because I, I can't pay attention and because all of these things, but understanding like, oh no, this is a working memory issue that helped me so much because then I had language for what it was. I could educate others on what was going on. And I also knew, oh, that's the error code that my brain is sending me right now. This is a working memory issue. And I know what to do about that now. I have strategies. So if I'm listening to somebody and I'm getting distracted by you know, some thought in my head and that's taking up a working memory slot and my working memory is already limited, I know that I'm not gonna be able to pay attention to what this person is saying or hold it in my head unless I get this other stuff out of my head. So a lot of times I'll say, oh, hang on. Like, I really want to hear this. I want to give you my full brain. This is, this seems important. Let me get this thought out of my head real quick. And I will write it down. And then I will be able to, you know, I'll, I'll have my working memory free to pay attention to this conversation. Um, I, I have a lot of tricks like that, but it, it, if I didn't have the language for it, if I, then I wouldn't know what was going on and I would just continue to feel dumb. Works so much better than masking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so much of what people with ADHD are encouraged to do kind of, uh, sometimes explicitly, but at least implicitly is to hide their struggles. And that's not great, right? Like that's not helpful. Um, so I've really tried to do a better job of, um, of showing up and saying, Hey, like I want to participate. I want to be able to meet these expectations, but I need to do it in a way that works for my brain and be honest about this is a struggle for me. Um, 
and, and make that make these invisible obstacles visible to other people, because otherwise it just looks like, you know, it looks like we don't care. It looks like we're not trying. And that's the advice we get, right? Is like, well, you know, here's why you should care about this. And, and you just need to try harder. You know, so much potential needs to try harder was written on so many report cards. Um, and so by educating people and making it a little bit more visible, um, it, it's not only helpful for me, but it's helpful for the people around me, I think, too, to understand why I'm struggling and that there are things that can that I can do about it, but they don't involve putting more effort in because effort for us is not the problem. Right. You know, I'm struck as you, um, as you're talking by the fact that, um, you know, we have 2,300 people here live and we're up to uh, 330 comments that people, people have posted, like the, the power of the community that you've created and specifically because you are saying out loud, um, that these are these are bona fide challenges. These are, this is a real diagnosis. These are real challenges impacting real people's lives. How, did that take you by surprise as you started on this journey, how powerful it would be to find other people um, and to, to connect with them over these challenges? It did because it normalized it and it legitimized it. Um, connecting with other people and also reading these research papers and seeing the statistics and realizing, oh, this this is not something that I'm making up or, or that I shouldn't be struggling with. It turns out it's actually weird if you're not struggling with this stuff and you have ADHD. Um, there, you know, there's all this data and there are actual terms for, for the things that we struggle with. And also we're not alone. It is such a cool experience to be in a room full of other people with ADHD at, um, at like the international ADHD conference, because you look around the room and everybody's struggling with the same things that you are. And it, it does become normalized and legitimized. Um, but the first, the first time I got any glimpse of like, maybe this is a real thing and I'm not just, you know, it's not just this quirky fun, like, Ooh, butterfly, um, thing is I watched a video by this woman named just Jen. Um, and this was when I had decided to start my YouTube channel, I was kind of seeing what else was out there and there wasn't a lot, but I found this one video and this woman was commenting on an article about ADHD and she was really really passionate and very, um, matter of fact in her language. And she spoke about ADHD, like it was a real thing and that it was worth taking seriously. And I had never heard that before. I had only heard jokes about it. I'd only, you know, seen these caricatures of ADHD on TV and, um, and after a lifetime of not being taken seriously myself and like people laughing about how I would lose my head if I, if it wasn't attached, I had never thought to take it seriously. So, um, I don't remember what the question was at this point, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it, yep. I don't remember the question. I was, I was going to well, bring it back, but no, it's, it's great because it leads right into another question. I wanted to ask about emotional dysregulation and you wrote in the, in the book that, you know, you grew up being told that you were overreacting, right. That, that this isn't a big deal. Why are you having strong emotions about this? And so basically you were taught that like your big emotions were, were wrong. Mm -hmm. um, that I was, I was too sensitive or like, I shouldn't be feeling the way that I was feeling. And I, I got, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one who heard this, but like my dad would say, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about, which the, the message there is not only will I punish you for having these big feelings. So stop, but also you know, it, there's no reason to have them, right? Like I'll give you something to cry about implies that I didn't have anything to cry about or that I shouldn't be feeling this way. So you shouldn't be feeling this way and also stop or I will punish you. And those were the messages that I grew up with. And for you personally, you know, you hit a point in life when things got really, really hard. And this, this lesson that you had learned to like suppress your emotions or hide your emotions, like really did you a disservice, right? Like, what do you think you, in, in the end, um, like the value of acknowledging the emotional dysregulation that is, you know, no, it's not part of the DSM. We know it should be, right? Emotional dysregulation is part and parcel of ADHD. And like, how has coming to understand that helped you in more healthfully, you know, managing your emotions and not allowing well, them to blow up. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, part of it was the acceptance of, okay, I have big emotions. Because, yeah, for so much of my life, I tried not to. I tried to suppress my emotions. I tried to hide my emotions. I tried not to feel things. And what would end up happening is, like, say anger, right? Like I am, as a woman, I'm not supposed to be angry. It's not ladylike or whatever. So, um, so I would try not to be angry. And if I started being angry about something, I would intellectualize and I would talk myself out of it and I would suppress it and all of these things, but then it, it would build up. And at some point it would just burst out of me and I would just like scream at my partner or yell at my parents or whatever. Um, because it turns out that's not how it works. You can't just be like, you shouldn't feel that. And then your brain's like, okay, I won't like, that's not how it goes. Um, it ends up, you know, you sublimate that anger and it, sh it shows up in different ways or, or you suppress it and it bursts out of you. So instead I learned that it's much better if you do have these big emotions to learn how to manage them and how to regulate them. But that's not, that doesn't mean suppressing them or hiding them. What that means is naming them, right? The, there's, um, uh, I forget who the expert is, but he talks about name it to tame it. If you, if you recognize what you're feeling and you name it, that, that in and of itself diffuses the situation a little bit, um, process it, uh, let yourself feel these emotions. Let you let yourself sit in these emotions. Um, there were so many times that I was just like, don't go away, go away, go away to my emotions. And it wasn't until I went through trauma therapy after my mom died and, and that brought my mom died in a really traumatic way. And like, it brought up a lot of trauma from when I was a kid. And so I went to trauma therapy for that. And, um, and my therapist taught me to sit with the feelings and let them exist. And she said, you know, your body really can't handle these huge emotions for longer than maybe 20 minutes. You can't sustain this. So just sit with it and imagine it. And so I, I did, I did like visualization exercises and I imagined like the, you know, this, this pain or, you know, this trauma or whatever. Um, and I would hold it up and it would look like this glass tube that squeezed my heart and it hurt when, when somebody put a coin into it, like when it was triggered. And, and so like, I would hold the tube up in, in my imagination and it would, I would sit with it long enough that it would turn into glass glitter and fall down harmlessly. And, and that would resolve it. Whereas before I just kept trying, trying to kick that can down the road essentially until I couldn't anymore and I blew up. So that was one of many strategies that I learned for dealing with emotions. But, um, but I had to unlearn a lot of really negative messages about your, your emotions are inconvenient. Don't have them. Okay. Thanks. Um, I had to, I had to learn, no emotions serve a purpose. The, the emotions are not the problem. What you do with them might be a problem, right? Like if you're angry and you hit or kick somebody, like that could be a problem, but the emotion itself isn't the problem. So learning healthier ways to cope with the emotions as opposed to trying not to have them was really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a, such a valuable insight, not only for caregivers who may be parenting emotional children, but also for the grown up children we are who did yeah. hear these messages that kind of invalidated our emotions. Right. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to add one thing real quick. Cause this yeah, was really helpful for me and it, it was meant for, it was like something to say to kids, but I still say it to myself sometimes to delineate. You get to be angry. You don't get to be mean. It's just, it's really simple and it's been really helpful for me. Mm. Can we like make that the slogan of the internet? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody start a social media platform that just says at the top, you get to be angry. You don't get to be mean. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Whole platforms would shut down. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so this, this led me to another um, related insight that you shared in the book that, um, you know, in writing this book, there were bumps along the road. Um, and that if you did miss a deadline or turn in work that you were, that you felt less than awesome about um, that, it would kind of trigger emotions about past failure, some overwhelm, some hopelessness. And you brought in this concept um, that um, Brendan Mahan had, has coined called the wall of awful. Um, and I think that even if you don't know what the wall of awful, if you don't know that concept, you can imagine, right? But uh, to those listening, um, how, how did you get over the wall when you felt that those, um, that uprising of uh, past failures stopping you from future successes. Um, I have I have a lot of tricks for dealing with the wall, but one of them is I try not to let the wall get too big. Right, like the longer we avoid something or the longer we sit in shame about something, the more <laughs> the more bricks that wall kind of has time to 
to add. And so I would start to recognize like, oh, I'm starting to build up a wall of awful around this. I need, I need to, I need to take action. Um, and that's not one of the ways that, that Brandon talks about dealing with it. Actually. I just, um, I just realized that this is like, this is one way that I deal with it is to try not to let the wall get too big because the more times we fail, the longer we go, the longer we avoid, um, the more we sit and like berate ourselves, the, the higher that wall gets. And, um, and it's, it's exhausting climbing that wall. Um, and it takes time and I did not have time. So I'm like, nope, nope, we can't let that, we can't let that wall get very big. So I would, first of all, like take action right away a lot of the time. Um, so instead of, um, instead of going weeks, you know, ghosting my editor and, and hiding from her, I, as soon as I realized I was off track, I would email her. I would, I would be like, this is what's going on because then, then I'm not adding more bricks to the wall. Um, I'm communicating with her as to what's happening and then she can let me know what to do. Um, so that was helpful. And then sometimes I got a friend to help. So there was one time where I, I don't even know if it was a wall of awful. I was just exhausted. I was sitting in my car and I could not get up the energy to go into my office and finish this freaking chapter. And I just need to do, I just needed to do maybe two, three hours worth of work, but even getting out of my car and walking into my office felt like too much. And so I ended up calling, calling this person and saying like, Hey, would you mind body doubling with me? I don't think I can go into my office, but I think I can go home and work on it there. And then we body doubled. And, um, and so I tried to tackle things right away before they, um, before they got too out of hand. Um, because I just know from personal experience that, yeah, the longer, <laughs> the longer I wait, the bigger that wall, wall is going to be and the harder it's going to be for me to climb it. Absolutely. Um, okay. I want to shift a tiny bit. So first I'm going to quickly thank again, our sponsor for today's webinar, which is a century. Um, and then I wanted to shift just to recognize that, um, there are a lot of women specifically here, not to discount the experiences of the men who are joining us here and those who are non-binary. Um, but I was struck looking at your YouTube channel, the fact that your video on ADHD and women is the most viewed video on your channel with more than 4 million views. And I looked through the more than 9,000 comments there. Um, about largely women who were not diagnosed um, as children. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts about, <sighs> about the current state of, of research on ADHD in women, where you would like to see this go for the next generation um, and kind of what your hopes are for, um, yeah, for science. Now that you've read all the science, um, where would you like, where were the gaps? Where were the holes? Yeah. No, that's it. That's, that's exactly it. Like after writing this book, I'm like, okay, wh what else is there to learn? And science is like, I ah, not like you're done. Like there, we don't have that research yet. And I'm like, but I, but why <laughs> until now, anything I wanted to know was on, you know, I could Google it. And if, if Google didn't know, then Google Scholar knew. And if Google Scholar didn't, like I, I would find it in a research paper. And I have this insatiable curiosity and I could just find the answers. And I was like, whoa, we know so many things. But now we're at the point where I'm asking questions that we don't have the research for and we don't know the answers to. So I, I am curious. Um, I am hoping to inspire and encourage research on the topics where we don't have enough on. And with when it comes to ADHD and women, um, there's, there's a few things like one is um, how does our ADHD evolve over the lifespan? I think there's, there's something really interesting there. How, how do hormones impact? Um, we have some research and Dr. Russell Barkley um, put up a really good video on his channel recently talking about the maybe five research papers that we have on, on ADHD and hormones. And then this one paper that, that posited this theory of there are these four times in our lives that, hormones really impact. So there's puberty, which by the way, that's when I got diagnosed. <laughs> um, because yeah, going through puberty, adding the, you know, the hormones, plus I went through some trauma at the time. It was just kind of this perfect storm and my more internalized symptoms suddenly started being more externalized and it was more obvious my struggles. Um, and I was, you know, I was yelling things at my mom, like, Hey, you, I wish you'd die. Um, you know, I, I was this like really good, quiet, shy kid suddenly, you know, losing her shit. So, um, <laughs> that that's one time when it can impact, um, then during our cycle, it impacts, uh, we know that 
uh, our ADHD symptoms show up differently throughout a menstrual cycle. Um, and Dr. Barkley goes into why that is. And then at, um, during pregnancy and postpartum, and then again at menopause. So these are four, you know, four times in our lives. And like, if it's during your cycle, it's happening every month, but where hormones really play a role and impact how our treatment is going to work for us. And if we need to adjust that treatment, um, and yeah, it's, it's really interesting, but we need more research on that. Um, I think we also definitely need more research on the safety of medication during pregnancy, um, because we, we just don't have great research on that. It, medication is still in a class where we're like, we don't know. Um, and so it's, it's tough. It's tough making decisions about treatment during pregnancy because we don't have enough information on that. There was one study that was done um, a couple of years ago that's really cool about the impact on the pregnant person of going off their medication during pregnancy. But it was a very small study. It was, um, it was a pilot study and like the sample size was small. So I would love to see more research on that um, so that women can make, uh, and women further, furthers, pregnant people in general can make better decisions as to like, do we go down on our medication? Do we go off our medication? Like, do we go off our medication for that first trimester? Is that the most critical? Like, we just don't know. We don't have enough information to really make, um, you know, very definitive statements about any of this. So it's, it's frustrating. And there are still women who are being told to go off their medication entirely um, as if it's not a choice when, you know, the, the best to, our, to the best of our knowledge now, it should be a choice. It should be you're weighing the impact of not treating the ADHD against the potential unknowns of staying on this medication, right? So I would love to see more on that. Um, and then uh, on trans trans experiences. So um, we, we know to a certain extent that hormones have an impact on ADHD symptoms, but how does that show up for people who are trans and taking, um, taking estrogen supplements or, um, or, you know, it, how much of the, the ways that ADHD shows up in differently in women is because of socialization versus how our brains are naturally. So there, there's just a ton of, ton of research that I would like to see there. And this, this topic of um, ADHD and pregnancy is a, is a personal one for you. Um, mm -hmm. You've announced it on your channel. So I feel like it's, it's kosher to, to yeah. announce that you are um, going to become a new mom very soon um, and have had to learn like firsthand how ADHD symptoms change with the hormonal changes of pregnancy. Um, how's it going? How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. It's, it's been interesting. There's, um, I think we're putting out a video. Uh, if you, if you're not subscribed to our channel, um, and hit the notification bell and you're interested in this topic, do it. We have a video coming out on Thursday, I believe, uh, that's uh, answering all the questions about pregnancy, including what decision I made about my own medication, um, how my pregnancy is going, how I'm feeling, how the ADHD seems to have impacted, um, the pregnancy and vice versa. Um, but I'm feeling pretty good right now. And part of that is, I feel like this will probably be relatable. I get to, I get to go to the hospital in a couple of days. Um, so on Thursday, I'll be checking into the hospital. I have a pregnancy complication with, um, with the, the placenta, the baby's doing great. The baby's amazing. Um, but just, you know, the placenta implanted in a, in a weird place. So like the exit is blocked. So they have to, they have to watch me. Um, for a couple of weeks. And then I have a C-section plan. That's going to be a few weeks before, before the thing. But I keep telling people I'm looking forward to my hospital vacation, uh, because having to slow down just because you're pregnant is actually really difficult. It turns out. So I keep trying to do all the same things and, and take advantage of these opportunities and coming and do webinars. And like, I'm working as much or more than I usually do. And I'm so tired. I'm so tired. You guys like going up and down stairs is, is a real challenge at this point. So I'm just really looking forward to being told like you are going to stay in this one place and not move for two weeks. Um, it's not, it's not bed rest, but like I have to be in the hospital. Um, and I'm just, I'm really looking forward to having that like external, like forced slowdown because it's been really tough, um, to, to not override, you know, my, my own body or brain saying like, Hey, we need to slow down just because I get excited about things. I want to do things. I'm like, it's attitude. Like, of course I want to come talk to attitude, right? Like I have a hard time saying no to things unless I absolutely have to say no to things. So that's, that's, I think one of the, the bigger challenges. So right now I'm feeling great. Um, and I'm just, I'm excited to be feeling great and still have somebody say, all right, you're done. 
Well, not everybody releases New York Times bestseller during their third trimester. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you, <laughs> you've got a lot of big goals and big talent that are coming to bear at the same time as a very big job ahead. So um, we do so much appreciate you um, working attitude in before new motherhood, um, which is so exciting. Um, and I think that's, you know, we, that might be uh, one of our last questions here. I'll see how much we can squeeze in. Is just, what are the things that are on your mind if you have even gotten a chance to think that far to the postpartum, like postpartum care for women with ADHD, you know that the hormones are going to impact symptoms. Things like working memory are going to take a hit um, as well as emotional dysregulation, right? How much can you prepare in advance? And is it just a matter again of understanding that these are real bona fide symptoms and, um, and, leaning into the science, um, and trying to accept and manage them. Yeah. I think, um, in this case it's understanding, but also putting supports in place. So historically when I've gone through like the worst moments of my life or the most difficult moments of my life have, they've also been when I've had the least amount of support. Um, unfortunately, uh, my mom got in a really bad car accident when I was in, um, when I was 12, uh, or when I was 11, 12, um, and we had to switch schools and we traded our couch for a hospital bed and like a couple of her friends died and I was really close to them. Um, and I had, you know, we, we switched schools and I, I kind of lost, I lost my mom, um, in a way because she was in a hospital bed, she was incapacitated. So she had been doing a lot of the things that I needed in terms of supporting my executive function. And that was no longer happening. She wasn't able to be there to be emotionally supported through this transition, obviously, I didn't have my friends around me because we had switched schools. Like I just, I really was going through a tough time and I didn't have the support I needed. And then when my mom died, like that was during COVID. And I had, you know, I had a guy that I was living with at the time who's now the father of my child, but it was a very difficult year. Um, he's ADHD, so he's autistic and ADHD. And my emotional needs were really great and too much. There were too much. And so he, he withdrew a little bit. He tried to be there for me, but he didn't really know how to be in the ways that I needed. Um, and I was in a new city. Um, I'd moved here to date him and, uh, COVID shut everything down. So we ended up moving in together really quickly. Uh, but nobody, there was nobody around. And even if there was, they couldn't come and sit with me because everybody was locked down because of COVID. So I went through that, um, losing my mom unexpectedly. Um, at a time when I didn't have a lot of support. And there were just a few times like that throughout my life. And so one of the big things that I'm doing now is I'm trying to give myself a corrective experience and I'm putting a lot of support in place around myself. So my aunt's coming up to stay with us for a week after afterward. Um, and then my sister's coming for a week after that. I have uh, Dusty Chapora. If, if you guys don't follow Dusty, she's wonderful for ADHD and pregnancy. She's an ADHD coach. She's the, she's a certified doula. Um, she lives in Canada, but she offered to be my postpartum doula. So she's going to be coming down once a week to check on me and make sure that I'm doing okay. Um, I have already like set up everything for the, for the nursery. Cause I don't know how I'm going to feel. I don't know if I'm going to feel like doing anything. So I have everything already set up and ready to go. Um, and yeah, and I'm putting a lot of supports in, in place. I'm, I have a therapist that I'm, you know, help like working with to help me with the transition into um, parenthood, uh, you know, my prescriber knows, like I, I've, I've told everybody, Hey, this is what I need. And then I've also, there's been people who, who have volunteered like, Oh, Hey, yeah, let me know if you need anything or, um, call me, you know, even if it's the middle of the night, like call me and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you if you're anxious about like, do you need to take your baby to the doctor or whatever? Um, and as people have been offering things, I've been saying like, do you mean mm -hmm. this? Because if you mean this, I will put your name on a list and, and put your name, your contact information and what you said you would help with if you mean it. And I will put that on a list so that when I need that support, then I will, I will know who to go to for what. And that's been really helpful so that when I'm in a position where I need support, I don't have to be like, who can I call? I don't want to bother anybody. I can be like, okay, this one person said this specific type, type of support they're absolutely willing to give. So if that's the kind of support I need, I have a, a list of who I can go to for that. Um, and it reminds me of, there is a, uh, this is the last thing I'll say, I promise. <laughs> there was a, a, um, a, se a session at one of the international ADHD conferences last couple of years um, where they talked about 
um, having sources of, sources of support and to make a list of, of the people that you can go to for support for different things and put your, your partner on the bottom of the list. And the reason you do that is because that's the person that we often go to first. So put them at the bottom, run through your other supports first so that you don't burn out your, your primary source of support essentially. So I'm trying to do that as well. So smart. Yeah. I don't know where we got this idea that asking for help was a sign of weakness because this sounds incredibly strong, <laughs> this, this support system that you've put in place. And it, um, I'll share really quick. I loved the point you made in the book about um, as a, as a support for executive function, um, um, delegating, but not delegating specific tasks. Cause that's hard to be like, here's my grocery list, please buy mm -hmm. these things, but to delegate whole categories, like yeah. you're in charge of feeding us. I yeah. absolutely loved that. Um, and I hope that you are able to do that in, you know, the, the months ahead. Um, it sounds like you are entering, um, motherhood with a really balanced and, um, emotionally <laughs> healthy approach to, um, to what is certainly going to be a challenge. And you just don't know exactly where those challenges are going to pop up. I hope so. I mean, I'm, I'm preparing for something I've never been through before. Right. So like I have all these ideas of, of how it's going to go and, and then, you know, I'm going to get there and be like, Oh no, this was a, nope, this isn't going to work at all. Like I, I have to rethink this whole plan, but at least I'm going in with a plan, which is, mm -hmm. which is helpful. Um, and, uh, and my partner and I are in a really strong place um, right after this podcast uh, or right after this webinar, I'm going to be posting a video about um, how my partner and I have navigated things um, recently and gotten to a good place because my ADHD, my anxiety is, you know, is a challenge for a relationship, his autism, and it turns out CPTSD diagnosis and ADHD, like he's got a lot of stuff going on. So talking about delegating entire areas of responsibility, one of the big things that I had to learn was delegate that responsibility for his mental health to him <laughs> and to his his mental health care team. Because for a long time, I tried to be that support because I do know so much about uh, neurodiversity and I do know all these strategies and stuff. I tried to be his support. I tried to I tried to make it my area of responsibility and we ran into a lot of issues with that. So we're going to talk about that in that episode. Well, there are a lot of people um, here today who can't wait for your series of videos on parenting. So uh, to, to new chapters and new beginnings, I'm so sad that we're out of time because I feel like I could have talked to you for hours. But um, but Jessica, this was really a joy to, to have this conversation with you. Um, congratulations on the book congratulations on this next chapter best of luck over you know the next few weeks um and months but um you are entering a, such a wonderful a wonderful time of life so congratulations on all of these fronts <laughs> i'm excited about it thank you so much <laughs> i appreciate it and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, thank you for submitting your questions and for engaging in our community and in the How To ADHD community. Um, please know we do have also a library of Attitude webinars. They're available on, um, on our podcast, the ADHD Experts podcast. So you can go back and um, some people were asking to learn more about body doubling, for example, and rejection sensitive mm -hmm. dysphoria. You have videos on these things. We have podcasts on these things. Um, there's a wealth of information in there. And um, we actually have another webinar later this week for those of you who are joining us live on um, identifying and overcoming self-sabotaging behaviors. So please join us on Thursday for that. In the meantime, everyone, thanks for being here. Jessica, thank you again. Um, and we hope to see everyone again soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>